Hi, my name's Simon Baldock, and this podcast is called Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity. It's the story of how I conquered my insecurities and shyness and went on to have a 35-year career in broadcasting both in the UK and in Spain. You'll hear some of my most memorable celebrity interviews and all the adventures I've had and the stories behind them. Like the time I delivered half a carcass of beef to Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street and the time I carried a million pounds worth of diamonds on the tube in an old Sainsbury's bag on the way to a photo shoot with Lord Snowden at the Ritz. Hello and welcome to this episode of Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity. And it's another of a short series of shows that I'm currently doing, looking back at some of the interviews I carried out from stars from programmes which I followed when I was a youngster, still at school and obsessed with a number of American sci-fi shows, which, when you look back at them, were very crude in the special effects department, but back then to me, and I'm sure millions of others, had us glued to the screen, mesmerised by the costumes and spaceships and beings from another world. And the most famous of them all, of course, was Star Trek. And this week you'll hear from two of its stars, who I spoke to in around 2006. George Takai, who played Lieutenant Sulu, and the undisputed king of the Star Trek captains, James T. Kirk himself, William Shatner. The first episode of Star Trek was aired on the 6th of September 1966 in Canada and two days later in America. The show was created by Gene Roddenberry as a wagon train to the stars. Star Trek was set in the 23rd century and featured the voyages of the starship USS Enterprise. The show lasted three seasons, although it seems a lot longer due to its continued repeats and was finally cancelled in 1969. After it was cancelled and went into syndication, its popularity exploded. It featured themes such as a utopian society and racial equality and featured the first African-American officer in a recurring role. Ten years later, Star Trek The Motion Picture reunited the cast on the big screen aboard a refurbished USS Enterprise. They all appeared in five subsequent films, the last being in 1991, which was during the production of the spin-off series Star Trek The Next Generation, and shortly before Gene Roddenberry's death. Several original series characters also appeared in the seventh movie Star Trek Generations and in other Star Trek productions. George Takai, who I mentioned before, played Lieutenant Sulu. Like all the rest of these interviews, I literally contacted through his website. He's now 85 and was born to Japanese-American parents with whom he lived in a US-run internment camp during World War II. He began pursuing acting in college, which led in 1965 to the role of Sulu, which he returned to occasionally in the 1990s. Upon coming out as gay in 2005, he became a prominent proponent of LGBT rights and active in state and local politics. He's been a vocal advocate of the rights of immigrants, in part through his work in the 2012 Broadway show Allegiance, about his internment experience and has won several awards and accolades for his work on human rights and Japan-United States relations, including his work with the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, California. But acting has always been a huge part of his life, and not always Star Trek related. You've starred in some 30 feature films, because I suppose a lot of people associate you, of course, with Star Trek, but you've done so much besides that. Well, that's the thing about an association with an enormously popular uh, television and movie series that, uh, uh, that's that been around for so long. You do other work, but uh, it seems to get overwhelmed by uh, the great... Uh, longevity and presence of uh, Star Trek. What was it like when you discovered that uh, they were going to make the motion picture? Because you'd done all those years in Star Trek, and then, you know, it went sort of quiet. And then the the offer came in of, you know, the big screen. It, it, mu- it must have been fantastic. Well, actually, uh, we uh, our ratings were very low when we were on television. 
despite the fact that we announced at the beginning of each episode that we were on a five-year mission, <laughs> uh, we our five-year mission was aborted after the third year because of low rating. You know, it was heartbreaking because we knew we were doing good work, but that's the nature of showbiz. And so we thought we'd uh, carry on with the rest of our career and our lives. But uh, in the reruns was where the uh, show found its audience. And yeah. The ratings skyrocketed. So as early as 1973, uh, we started hearing rumors of, of the show being revived. And there were many, many false alarms like that. And so uh, uh, whenever Paramount would announce another possible uh, resurrection of the series, we, we got a little jaded because Wolf had been called too often. And so finally, when they said that they were going to do this movie with a huge budget, uh, we were a bit cynical until they announced that they signed Robert Wise, this legendary director of Hollywood fame. And when it finally happened back in 1978, I think it was, we thought uh, it was just undreamt of. And, mm. and when we uh, got back on that circular bridge set. Uh, it was such a heady experience. Uh, it was one of the most memorable moments uh, in my experience with uh, Star Trek. Which is your favorite film? Well, that's certainly the best film. Uh, <laughs> the one that I uh, subtitled Captain Sulu to the Rescue, <laughs> Star Trek VI. Absolutely. And you finally got promotion. Indeed. It took a long time, but uh, <laughs> Starfleet finally the right thing. <laughs> and do you have a, a, a favorite episode from the TV series? Yes, I think that's the one um, uh, titled uh, Naked Time, in which uh, Sulu finally gets unchained from that console and uh, gets to demonstrate his uh, swashbuckling prowess. <laughs> Hasn't he just got the best voice? I love listening to him speak. Incidentally, George Takai these days has a huge social media presence and has won several awards and has over 9 million fans on Facebook, as well as his own very popular YouTube channel. So do check him out. Now, Captain Kirk, William Shatner, who began his screen acting career in Canadian films and television productions before moving into guest starring roles on various US television shows. He appeared as Captain Kirk in all the episodes of Star Trek, the original series, 21 of the 22 episodes of Star Trek, the animated series, and the first seven Star Trek movies. He's written a series of books chronicling his experiences playing Captain Kirk and has also co-written several novels set in the Star Trek universe and a series of science fiction novels called Tech War that were adapted for television. Outside Star Trek, Shatner played the veteran police sergeant in T.J. Hooker and has hosted the reality-based television series Rescue 911, which won a People's Choice Award for Favourite New TV Dramatic Series. His appearance as a guest star in two episodes of the television detective series Columbo, almost two decades apart, were among his many such contributions to television shows from the 1970s onwards. Shatner's television career after his last appearance as James Kirk embraced comedy, drama and reality shows. In seasons four and five of the series Third Rock from the Sun, he played the alien Big Giant Head, to which the main characters reported. From 2004 to 2008, he starred as attorney Danny Crane in the final season of the legal show The Practice and in its spin-off Boston Legal, a role that earned him two Emmy Awards. In 2016 and 17 and 2018, he starred in both seasons of Better Late Than Never, a comical travel series in which a band of elderly celebrities toured East Asia and Europe. But it's been Star Trek that has been and still is his most memorable role. Star Trek has been such a huge part of your life. Have you ever thought what would have happened if you hadn't got that role as James T. Kirk? You know, I came into Star Trek with um, with a fair amount of celebrity, and uh, it, I, it wasn't news to me to be uh, my name to be up there in the lights and mm. people coming to, to see me. Uh, and subsequently, the the tremendous popularity of Star Trek made me popular was different. It was more intense, but it's always been a part of my life. So I, I've 
almost all of my adult life has been spent in the in the limelight, so I, I, I don't know too much else. So no, I have not thought very often what would it have been like because so much has befallen me as a result of being in Star Trek. The good times keep rolling on. I, uh, there's a book coming out uh, I'm called I'm Working on That and and uh, a couple of movies, uh, Shoot or Be Shot, a big movie called uh, Showtime with Robert De Niro and a movie that I'm finishing up directing um, in post-production called Groom Lake and a variety of other things that are going on uh, in my life. Uh, but nothing is more interesting and uh, requiring uh, thought and creativity than Mind Meld and, and this website. Mm. Is it true you're, you're taking part in Aaron Spelling's edition of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire as well? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was on that uh, failing miser of, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know whether it's been on the air or not. Has it been on the air? I don't think we'll be seeing it here either, so you can tell us how badly you did. Well, no, I can't. I think I'm forbidden by God. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I didn't make, I, I, maybe I can tell you this much. I didn't make a million dollars for charity. Right. And I had, I, I had this fantasy. I, I was also on uh, Weakest Link that's come out of your country. Wow. In an attempt to make money for uh, these charities that I had. Yes. And I had these this fantasy that I was going to get all this money and, and pour it, uh, you know, like like a salve over everybody's wounds. I was going to heal the world with all this money I was going to win, and, and I didn't quite make as much money as I know. You're not alone. Don't worry. I know, but it's, it, it's one thing not to make the money for yourself, but it's worse when you have handicapped children and animals and, and people who will, who will gain by the money you can put, give them and you don't, you're not able to give it to them. It's mm. actually it's stunning mm. when you're working for charity and and you can't do it. And what was Anne Robinson like? Did she scare you to death? She doesn't introduce herself uh, to the people on the show in the beginning, and then I shambled off at the end <laughs> so that I didn't see. Her. So I really never met her. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, I grasp her firmly in my arms. I bend her over in a, uh, a tango kiss, and she swoons. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. Well, listen, I'm glad you've got her over there. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to. She's your treasure, but uh, yeah. she's our uh, option. Absolutely, yes, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> William Shatner. Aside from acting, Shatner has had a career as a recording artist, beginning in 1968 with his album The Transformed Man. His cover versions of songs are dramatic recitations of their lyrics rather than musical performances. The most notable of them are his versions of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and Mr Tambourine Man, and the rendition of Elton John's Rocket Man, his most successful album was his third, Seeking Major Tom, in 2011, which includes covers of Learning to Fly, Space Oddity and Bohemian Rhapsody. In 2021, Shatner flew into space aboard the Blue Origin suborbital capsule. At the age of 90, he became the oldest person to fly into space. And that's it for another week. In the next episode of Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity, you'll hear from Face Man, Dirk Benedict from the A-Team as well as Battlestar Galactica and one of my favourite ladies who was originally born in Essex before moving to Canada Amanda Tapping, star of Stargate SG-1, who I met at a Stargate convention near Heathrow Airport. I was watching you um, doing a, a Q&A earlier on. <laughs> you're very good, aren't you? You must enjoy it. It looks like you're enjoying I it. I do. I really do enjoy it. It's. Uh, I'm very nervous at first. But once you get going, really what you do is you open it up and the fans ask the most fantastic questions, which lead you into all sorts of crazy stories. So I have a great time up there. I mean, a lot of them about the show, obviously. And fans of science fiction in general, I find to be highly intelligent. And they have a an encyclopedic knowledge of the show. So they probably know more about the show than I want than I do. But they also ask a lot of other questions too, which is really interesting. I mean, then you open up sort of stories about your personal life, and so it's been really funny. That's next week on Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity. 